Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, uh, KK Yeo from the National Heart Center, Singapore. I'm also the uh, scientific chair of the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, webinar on the cardiometabolic syndrome, uh, a joint a symposium organized by the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology and the Pakistan Cardiac Society and hosted by the Taiwan Heart Foundation. Um, welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my two coach, my two chairpersons, uh, Professor Lin uh, from Taiwan and Professor Sumru from Pakistan. You will also see from the program that we have an esteemed panel of uh, uh, panelists and speakers. Uh, Professor uh, Harun uh, Baba will be one of our panelists together with Professor uh, Lin uh, Songxian from uh, Taiwan. And our speakers uh, will feature uh, Professor Shabas uh, Qureshi, Professor Abdullah Shahab and, uh, prof and Dr. Uh, Chen Haomin uh, from Taiwan. Um, uh, I, uh, Professor Abdullah is uh, from the United Arab Emirates and uh, Professor uh, Shabazz Qureshi is from Pakistan. So uh, with that introduction, I, I bid you a warm welcome and have you uh, take part in this uh, uh, symposium. Um, the speakers will uh, give a 15 minute talk followed by five minutes for discussion. And then at the end of it, we will have a discussion over the general topic on the cardiometabolic syndrome. With that, I'd like to hand over uh, to Professor uh, Sumro to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Professor Sumro, over to you, please. So our first speaker is Professor Shahbaz Qureshi. He is based in Islamabad. He is president of Pakistan Aspirin Foundation. Professor and head of the department of Batim Medical College, Rawalpindi. Head of the department of federal government postgraduate medical institute in past. And uh, he is working as the head of the department of MBBS Medical College of uh, uh, post, uh, Islamabad. Dr. Shabazz Qureshi, please. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Khalda, for your kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I'm really grateful to the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology and uh, Pakistan Cardiac Society for giving me this honor to talk on the metabolic syndrome and Asian perspective. And I really feel very happy to discuss it because this is a, a very important topic that we need to address globally and in our part of the world. I have nothing to disclose as far as this presentation is concerned. And uh, what we need to see is what is the epidemiology of metabolic syndrome. And uh, when we look at the, the, the globe, we find that everywhere in each part of the world, metabolic syndrome <clears throat> is getting more and more prevalence. In the United States, for example- Professor Shabazz, of the adults Professor Shabazz, share. could you please uh, share you your screen, me? please? Uh, could you please share your screen, please? Uh, I thought I did. Okay, I'll try again. We can see you. I think something has happened because I actually was share. Now here we have this screen share and uh, <clears throat> I hope that now it is visible. Uh, is yes, it, it is. Uh, uh, you would have to put on presentation mode. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sorry, uh, so perhaps I can just take an extra minute. Uh, and uh, we, I was talking about the epidemiology of uh, metabolic syndrome. And uh, I was referring to it as a global problem. And in the United States, for example, one third of the population fits in with the definition and criteria for metabolic syndrome which was agreed to jointly by several international organizations. And the overall 
presentation, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome in the 80s and early 90s was 25% declining in early 2000 and then increasing again to a substantial 34%. And this actually coincides <clears throat> with the obesity, which is increasing all over the world. Now, when we look at uh, the metabolic syndrome, we have a number of uh, factors like the diet, physical activity, uh, fitness, socioeconomic status, the birth size, child growth, this is also very important, genetic constitution. And then you have the components of it, overweight, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, abdominal obesity is very important, ectopic fat deposition leading to diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. The metabolics, when we look at the metabolic syndrome, it is not just uh, the, the conditions I described. In insulin resistance, actually you can have uh, in systemic inflammation, which is very important. And this actually leads to atherosclerosis. Now, when we talk about the metabolic syndrome, it is not a new phenomena. It was uh, it, there present even in 1923. And in 1988, the role of insulin resistance in human disease was talked uh, about at the Banting lecture by Reven in 1988. And when we look at the metabolic syndrome, we have a very important components of hypertension, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, and adiposity, making a part of the metabolic syndrome. <clears throat> and this, along with the other risk factors like hypertension, obesity, etc., lead to atherosclerosis and endothelial dysfunction, which then leads to coronary heart disease. And this is very important because metabolic syndrome leads to diabetes, to cardiovascular diseases ultimately. And this is what was seen that in those patients who had metabolic syndrome, you would notice here that the coronary heart disease mortality was much higher. Cardiovascular disease mortality in them was high. And the all-cause mortality also was increased in patients who had metabolic syndrome and developed cardiovascular diseases. And then it is not only the type 2 diabetes and the cardiovascular diseases which are associated with metabolic syndrome. You have other conditions like fatty liver, you have polycystic ovary disease. Sleep disturbances are very important in these patients. What has happened is that it has actually, there has been an evolution of uh, metabolic syndrome over the years when we have come to a stage where we have become couch potatoes and that is where we have increased our weight and this has been what is known as the metabolic evolution so what are the characteristic features of metabolic syndrome number one central obesity number two high blood pressure very important high triglycerides the hdl level is low insulin resistance is high in these individuals and the obesity is uh, of a truncal uh, or a central obesity that we see in these patients with metabolic syndrome. Invariably, in the, it was seen in the Indians who, uh, because we uh, share the same subcontinent with them. And in comp comparison to the Caucasians, we have seen that uh, we have uh, sub more subcutaneous body fat. When we uh, check it with the, uh, the folds in the abdomen, we find it is thicker as compared to the Caucasians. Then we also have some uh, hump in the, in the back, just below our neck, and then a double chin. This also is uh, uh, one thing which may also signify a high risk for metabolic syndrome in urban Indians and may be used as a phenotype marker also. Now, what was seen in this uh, research was that uh, in the Indian and the British, if they have the same body mass index, they actually, the body fat is different, 21.2% uh, and uh, in, in the Indians and 9.1% in the British, uh, even though if the body mass index in them was uh, the same. And what we need to understand is that we have to keep a body mass index, which is normal, less than at least 22. 
So obesity, metabolic uh, susceptibility, and clustering of these—it's actually a—it's a syndrome. It's a—it's not a disease. It leads to diseases. It leads to diabetes. It leads to cardiovascular diseases. You have physical inactivity. In advancing age, you'll have uh, more of metabolic syndrome. You have body fat distribution, adipose tissue abnormalities, etc., which all make a. Uh, they, they are constituents of the metabolic syndrome. Now, an important point is that the, uh, the, in, uh, the metabolic syndrome in our part of the world, our waist circumference is the one which determines it. We have actually a lower weight circumference as compared to the Western population. It has to be if it is more than 90 centimeters in men and 80 centimeters in women, it is a risk factor that is abdominal obesity then you have a blood pressure a fasting glucose which is more than 100 blood, uh, blood pressure which is more than 130 85 they then constitute the metabolic syndrome and this is the ethnic variation that i've talked about because you have it in the south asian pop asian population in uh, the chinese population also it is the same in the japanese it is the same so basically in our part of the world we have to, uh, our heights are smaller and we have more of trunkal obesity and uh, we need to actually keep, keep our waistline much less than the Caucasians and that is how we can avoid metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome actually does, is not static. It's a, an evolving progressive disorder. You may have an early metabolic syndrome where it is healthy, a person first is healthy, he gets early metabolic syndrome where there is an adiposity, hyperinsulinemia, hyperglycemia, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. And in the late stages, you will have, as I showed to you earlier on, severe disease in the form of diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. Actually, in 2009, it was that the, uh, the description of the cluster of risk factors was harmonized and which, uh, so that you had a universal definition uh, of uh, metabolic syndrome. There are other synonym, uh, synonyms of metabolic syndrome where you have syndrome X, insulin resistance syndrome, metabolic syndrome X, et cetera, and the deadly quartet, which is part of it. So in Pakistani population, we need to have uh, this waist circumference less than 90 centimeters, a woman should be less than 80 centimeters. We must have triglycerides less than 150. In most of us have an HDL, which is low. And the blood pressure, actually, what I will show to you in the data is that nearly 46% of the population has high blood pressure and the fasting glucose 110. So these are the criteria which, when met, we can say that th this person has metabolic syndrome. This is the newer definition according to the IDF, where once again, uh, with the survey circumference, with ethnicity specific values, and then you have raised triglycerides, reduced HDL, raised blood pressure, and raised fasting plasma glucose, then you will be able to say that this person has metabolic syndrome. These are the different uh, definitions according to WHO, and CEP, IDF, and the EGIR. And I think uh, uh, I have alluded to them earlier on. When we talk, take the South Asian sub uh, uh, area, we find that in Pakistan, for example, according to IDF, we have 40% of the metabolic syndrome. In India, according to the uh, ATP3, but th these are all showing the different uh, areas where you have an incidence of metabolic syndrome. in the, now, a number of studies were done in Pakistan, and this is a very important study, the second National Diabetes Survey of Pakistan. And in this, it was from 2016 to 2017, where the, the, it was a multi-stage clustering technique in all the four provinces. And the conclusions of the study was that diabetes has reached epidemic proportion and urgently needs national strategies for early diagnosis and effective management, as well as cost-effective diabetes primary prevention program in Pakistan. This, this is a very important conclusion of the study. These are the diff uh, you'll see that the urban and the rural distribution of uh, diabetes 
in, uh, according to the study, both in men and women. And as the age advances, you will see that there is an increase in diabetes in this, these uh, uh, people in the study group. Similarly, in the urban and the rural also, this is the distribution according to the age. As the age advances, both in men and in women, it is very prevalent. The second study was about the glycated uh, hemoglobin, the cutoff values as the diagnostic tool in diabetes. It was part of the study. And the conclusion here was that on the second NDSP demonstrated disagreement between findings of OGTT and HbA1c as diagnostic tool for Pakistani population as compared with the international guideline. HbA1c threshold for prediabetes and NDD were lower in this part of the world. So we have to keep in, uh, keep in consideration all these things. Then hypertension to, in the same uh, uh, study to assess the prevalence and its associated risk factors for hypertension in urban and rural areas of Pakistan. This study concluded that 46% prevalence of hypertension alarming in Pakistan with its associate risk factors, like for example, diabetes, obesity, hence implementation laws with lifestyle changes, extremely important, creating education among the people, awareness are required on urgent basis to control or reduce the hypertension prevalence. This is to show the prevalence, both self-reported and newly diagnosed, and the blood pressure from the uh, different uh, provinces of Pakistan. You can see that the uh, distribution in both men and women, and now, obesity actually, because of dyslipidemia and lipotoxicity and coronary artery disease, ultimately will lead to heart failure. And it is extremely important that we reduce the incidence of obesity. And we look at when we look at the prevalence of obesity in Pakistan in the same study, the conclusion was that the prevalence of obesity is at epidemic proportions in Pakistan. So all this actually uh, is. Uh, keeping track of each other, hypertension is increasing or has increased, diabetes, pre-diabetes, and obesity, they all are going hand in hand, is at epidemic proportions in Pakistan, and it is calling for urgent lifestyle intervention strategies to prevent and manage this important cardiometabolic risk factors. And this is what you have, the general obesity and abdominal obesity in all the four provinces of Pakistan, once again, it's shown graphically. Then what about the anthropometric indices in Pakistani adults? In the, what was seen here was that the findings from the second uh, NDSP demonstrated that the waist circumference, this is important, is a better marker than waist hip ratio and body mass index in predicting type 2 diabetes for Pakistani population. So we have to keep the waist circumference in mind and this along with the other parameters like triglycerides, low HDL, uh, 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 the, uh, the other factors which combine together to result in metabolic syndrome. Then when you look at the major risk issue uh, of uh, dyslipidemia resulting in cardiovascular disease, and it was the same study which also studied the prevalence of dyslipidemia seems to be very high in Pakistan. And here I would just also add that in our part of the world or in Pakistan, especially what we saw was that the upper limits which, were, which have been uh, given by the other societies may not apply here. Even a lower level of total cholesterol or in Pakistan, Prevalence of dyslipidemia seems to be very high, necessitating an urgent call for early screening and effective management through life. lifestyle intervention at this part, uh, time is extremely important in our part of the world so as to reduce the, uh, the incidence of metabolic syndrome. Now, in India also, we saw that there was an increased incidence of metabolic syndrome and, the, and this is in the urban India where you can see the hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, low HDL and abdominal obesity. 
in urban India. Uh, metabolic syndrome is extremely high in this part of the world. And it is, this is the area where one fourth of the world population is concentrated. So you can imagine what is going to be the end result of it. And unless and until we take heat now and start with lifestyle changes urgently. Similarly, even in, in Bangladesh, it was uh, shown that there was a very high incidence of metabolic syndrome in Sri Lanka also similar findings were present. Now, when we talk of the metabolic syndrome, uh, I, what I feel is that actually the drums are beating. We have this, uh, 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 this lysemia, we have hypertension, overweight, LDL, which is uh, uh, high, triglyceride, which are there. And th this actually is like an acronym, which you can say Dholak. Dholak is a, uh, another word in our vernacular language for the drums. And therefore, the drums are beating as far as metabolic syndrome is concerned in Pakistan. So what should we do to actually uh, try to stem this rot? We need to have a healthy diet. We need to increase our physical activity. Smoking cessation is extremely important. Another very important thing is stress reduction. And this can happen through meditation, through yoga. And then another important point is improvement in sleep quality. You see, you have a diurnal variation of, of, the, of hypertension, of glucose, and also by the, the hormones which are released by the adipocytes. Therefore, if you improve the quality of life, of sleep also, you will improve or reduce the incidence of metabolic syndrome. And also, the prevention should start from maternal health care. And the neonates as far as breastfeeding is concerned. Then the government, governments in our part of the world should start with societal and infrastructural strategies. For example, there should be a planning of more walking courses so that a healthy attitude is built up and this should be to uh, uh, should, uh, we should be able to create an awareness about it in our population so that we can actually reduce the incidence of metabolic syndrome and thereby reduce the incidence of diabetes cardiovascular diseases which in our part of the world is actually reaching epidemic proportions so the take home messages are in Pakistan, the prevalence of obesity, metabolic syndrome and diabetes is high and rising, especially in the urban setting. Obesity is a major driver for widely prevalent metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes. And Pakistan, the Pakistani population exhibits a very unique feature of obesity, excess body fats, abdominal adiposity, increased subcutaneous and abdominal fat and deposition of fat in ectopic sites like liver where you can have fatty liver, muscle and others. You actually need to improve the muscular strength of our bodies. Metabolic complications in Pakistanis develop at lower value of BMI and waist circumference. And this is true for India, for Bangladesh, for Sri Lanka, for all those, all the countries in South Asia. And therefore, we actually need to take care of this. Pakistanis are especially at higher risk of getting cardiovascular diseases in comparison to the whites, and they have cardiovascular disease at a much younger age. That is important. Now, these are the six S's which I want all of us to remember. We need to cut down on salt. We need to cut down on sugar, saturated fatty acids, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, and we need to cut down on stress. And these, are, and we need to actually identify what we should do as societies for our people who are suffering from metabolic syndrome or who are going towards it and ultimately would have manifestation of diseases from it. And that the clock is actually ticking. And what we really have is from symptoms. And when a person is normotensive, they start developing insulin resistance, the metabolic syndrome comes in, hypertension and diabetes, 
atherosclerosis, and finally death. So the conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, honorable chairpersons, is modern hypertension guidelines have focused on strategies and we need actually to take care of it that we must control the patients uh, 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 who have blood pressure in our population, diabetes, and we must take care, we must understand that metabolic syndrome in our part of the world has reached epidemic proportions, resulting in diabetes, resulting in hypertension, and combined with this lipidemia and uh, smoking is causing a havoc as far as cardiovascular diseases are concerned, even at a younger age. I thank you all for your uh, patient listening. Thank you very much. And so we will move to another speaker. Question answers will be in the end of uh, presentations. Um, I, I hope I did not overshoot. Uh, you, we, we are moving towards the another speaker because we are short of time and we will be having the question answered in the end of session. Dr. Julian. Uh, Uh, I, I don't have any question. Uh, maybe we can give a keep a question, uh, maybe uh, at the discussion part because uh, I will be uh, out of the uh, schedule. Yeah. Yes. Maybe that we should move on to next next speaker. That, yes. That is that is my intention. So um, maybe I I I will just uh, introduce the the next speaker then. Um, our next speaker um, is uh, Professor um, uh, Shabab uh, from uh, the United uh, uh, Arab Emirates. Uh, he's the Vice President of the Gulf Intervention Society and Editor-in-Chief of the New Emirates Medical Journal. He's Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine. Um, and um, I would like him to uh, give his, uh, invite him to deliver his talk um, uh, on from syndrome X to cardiometabolic risk, uh, clinical and public health implications. Uh, over to you, Professor Shabab. Shahab. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, you know, with the virtual, we say good morning, good evening, because we are in different parts of the world. That's easy, accessible for everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I think my colleague already covered everything about metabolic syndrome uh, as a definition, and I've tried to uh, focus on syndrome X or what it's called nowadays, uh, Enoka. Uh, I have no disclosure. I'll just take you through this case, maybe uh, relevant to the metabolic syndrome. Is a 55 years old female with atypical chest pain. That means you have one out of the three uh, definition for angina. Retrosternal, uh, worse with worse with effort and disappear with the rest. So any of these one is is give you atypical. And the patient got. A family history of uh, cardiovascular disease and sedentary life, and already mentioned, you know, all the all the definitions for the metabolic syndrome patient has got. Already got hypertension, central obesity, high triglyceride, low HDL, HbA1c is pre-diabetic. You know, just tells you that again what is predominant here. Is it central obesity you're talking about? Is it is it fatty liver? Is it you know more to diabetic? Where are we heading? You know, is it early or late presentation, which is, you know, again, nice to discuss with my colleague uh, earlier. So this is, again, just refreshing your mind about metabolic syndrome. Uh, it's, uh, you know, as part of, of it is X syndrome, which is I'm going to show you some cases with multiple factors, um, starting with insulin resistance, which is, I think, the major play role in all our problems nowadays. And if we're able to control that, I think we can reverse many of the um, you know, acquired problems. It's highly prevalent, nicely discussed, uh, especially in our part of the world, we, our diet, our lifestyle, all, all uh, heading that way. And uh, you know, the numbers are striking. Um, there are many definitions, I already discussed this, I'm not gonna go through this, uh, and you know, also mention our guidelines about the metabolic syndrome in 2019. I think is what's relevant here is you know, having metabolic syndrome 
and then is at risk of having diabetes. Of course, having diabetes is, you know, that's increased our threefold to having cardiovascular disease. Uh, and really, we recently did a meta-analysis systematic review on or over than 200,000 uh, uh, population of at risk of cardiovascular disease. Our prevalence of cardiovascular disease in Middle East compared to the world, we are 10.3 percentage. That, and the world is four percentage. That we are more than two two times. And if we look at the leading risk factors in this part of the world, our hypertension is one and two. If you look one of two in UAE or Middle East, they have they have hypertension, and they have one and two. They have high cholesterol, and of course one and three they have diabetes. And these are the these are basically telling us you know where we're heading. And uh, nicely described, you know, we are at this age, I'm gonna discuss the cardiovascular disease. So it's actually, we are always looking at the tip, you know, tip of the eyes, you know, we think about this is what we do in the, in the cath lab, unfortunately, you know, we try to anything obstructive, we try to open. If not obstructive, we say the patient is fine. Uh, we are missing all this coronary microvascular dysfunction, diffuse cardiovascular disease, which really how highly relevant and to the patient and to the caregivers and to the, to the, to the, I think, the government, because the amount of money uh, spending these patients. Um, if you, you know, this is, this is taking us to the network of the heart. You know, it's not uh, only the three art major arteries we know. It's not this epicardial is important, which is represent only 5% of the network. It's the 95, which we, we don't, uh, you know, we don't see, you know, invisible. We used to think of, you know, believe in visible things. You know, we should think so we, we just touch and, and I think we are going back to the real, real things, you know, not invisible. And this is what things, and metabolic syndrome and X syndrome, you know, it's really related to all this. When you look, um, you know, see, we see it with diabetes, we see it with dyslipidemia, with estrogen withdrawal, you know, those ladies who are uh, menopausal, they're having the symptoms and because of the estrogen is missing, people with the, with the, with the, uh, hypertrophy uh, and 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 so on. Myocardial bridge, myocarditis. You know they have this typical symptoms. So we've been doing great job until recently. Is you know the cardiovascular disease is being you know not improving. That's for the reason already just discussed because the prevalence of incidence of the risk factors are increasing. And of course, not to mention the disparity of the management happening in, in our healthcare. Um, and but not to forget, we are missing, you know, we need to have a, a, a new way or new approach to the ischemic heart disease or microvascular dysfunction or X syndrome used to call it. An example here is a, is a, is a female here of, of middle age, you know, chest pain on effort and rest. This is, should really, you know, think about something going on. Normally we do a stress ECG, which is abnormal. Okay, we think of obstructive, we do angiography is normal. Then we say, hey, you have no problem. It's not your cardiac. And similar to somebody coming on and several times with the same problem, sub-maximal. Sub, sub and we don't know what to do with this patient. We say, okay, you're fine. You have nothing to do with your coronary. We look at the coronary is normal, either CT coronary or angio. But we call it X syndrome and halas. And that used to, we used to do that in the past. And I think, you know, uh, with, 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 with the recent guidelines tell us, you know, there are pa these patients more than you know uh, that we with you think about they have non obstructive okay then <laughs> maybe you see a bit of mild disease in their artery sometimes clear nothing there but these patients have got network has got microvascular dysfunction or basospastic angina or microvascular angina which we miss and this is you know we call it nowadays enoka and this is based on the latest uh, presentation so we used to think of the epicardial that big one this is what conducts the, 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 the flow, but the one which is modulate and, and, and really and, and, and use, use the, 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 the nutrition properly uh, for our cells, these are the myocardial uh, network. And of course, the pathophysiology of that are, could be structural problem, could be functional problem, could be extravascular. And, and just to give you an example here of the patient, here a 54 years old male, you know, overweight, you can fulfill the criteria of, of metabolic syndrome, hyperlipidemic hypertension, again, goes with that, you know, uh, and, and ejection fraction is normal, uh, risk ex positive uh, TMT. You look at their angiography, it's normal, and you do the, you know, you do the, you know, this is the microvascular 
uh, function test, which we, we need to do. I'm, I don't want to go into detail of this. Is this uh, you do uh, 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 IMR and uh, FFR and CFR, FFR for epicardial, CFR and uh, IMR for myocardial uh, uh, function. And this is here, you see an abnormality of that. And this is actually a patient got uh, microvascular uh, uh, angina. And the management of this patient, of course, is, you know, is just to improve their, uh, you know, effort by giving uh, uh, isoprolol, uh, its inhibitors and, and statin. And another patient who are slightly different, you know, 69, a female, again, look at the weight, obese, hyperlipidemia, hyperlipidemia fulfill the metabolic syndrome, you know, and atypical angina. You do a CT angiography, it's normal, and you do a coronary angiography, it's normal, but the stress is uh, abnormal, and you do the acetylcholine, and epicardial, this patient goes, uh, you know, both uh, epicardial uh, spasm as well as micro. Uh, vascular dysfunction. So this patient got mixed. So you've got epicardial, vasospastic, and micro. So need uh, medication here to manage both. Manage the vasodilate, the epicardial arteries, and work with also at the network down. So this patient given uh, a calcium antagonist with again focus on 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 on, uh, on medication for for the atherosclerosis like and and aspirin. And the third case is a bit you know <laughs> I think we all miss. We see it. This is a 50 years old male, uh, you know, for, for last year episode of chest pain, you know, sometimes with exercise, sometimes not. Vague uh, duration of, you know, when they get this, this kind of pain. And again, this is the one I've already showed you, submaximal. We don't know. We cannot reach a you know, little bit of change in, on the stress ECG. And you do the angiography. You find a bit of uh, stenosis here and there. You know, if you are in most of the <laughs> chronic, you know, cath lab, they just stint that, but you better to do FFR, which is again, not significant because it's above 8.8. .8. So you think, okay, fine, you are fine. You have no, no problem. You know, again, your pain is not due to the uh, coronary, but you know, you should, you should go further and do some, a test at the microvascular. And actually this patient got reduced FFR, uh, uh, CFR, sorry, and IMR. And this is, was, again, both. You got epicardial problem, which is atherosclerosis there, and uh, that's diffuse, and got microvascular. This patient needs optimal medical management. This goes with a ischemia trial nowadays, you know? Ischemia trials, you know, this is the one fulfilled that criteria. This is what we do. So this patient got microvascular angina and vasopastic angina. And the, this patient is a 41 years old female. Again, you can see that there's no weight here, no problem. But the patient got a history of diabetes. Again, having a diabetes, you know, it's, it's put you at all the risk of having cardiac disease. Patient got negative for ischemia, and again had the baseline and uh, you know angi angiography and ECG. But when you do a acetylcholine, it's very significant. So this patient got vasopastic uh, angina, and this patient uh, fulfilled the criteria to give something to dilate their arteries. This is what we miss sometimes. You know, we, we do angiography on a patient and we see myocardial bridge. And you say, okay, myocardial bridge, nothing to do for this patient, just, uh, you know, just vasodilate and, and that's it. But remember, the, vas the myocardial bridge is another uh, reason for a patient to get microvascular dysfunction. And on long term, the, micro, uh, the, the bridge gets worse. And sometimes we have to unroof this, but most of the time need patient to understand what's the underlying diagnosis, need a proper management, proper approach. Because if you, if, you don't, if you don't tell the patient the proper diagnosis, they will shop around and they get into the anxiety, all the risk, all the, you know, the psychiatric problem, as we all know. And this is the, from the evidence we have nowadays, orbita, courage, ischemia, all tell us, you know, it's not just uh, need to open every obstructive. There's sometimes no obstructive. You think about, you know, uh, my, my cardial, uh, coronary myocardial dysfunction and that's need the management here it should be proper diagnosis and proper management and I've already showed you the guidelines and how to approach that invasively because you can get real life uh, assessment and real life diagnosis and patient be reassured and uh, you know they thank you for that so pathophysiology myocardial ischemia is multifactorial Metabolic syndrome, as we mentioned, microvascular dysfunction may be structural, which I mentioned, or could be functional. And the functional, of course, the, the predominant one. And the, but 
really we all need to be, as we, if we take the patient to the cath lab, we should not just stop at the coronary angio, we should go beyond that and have a, to, to have a proper diagnosis for our patient. This patient, very interesting. I just want to maybe finish with this case. You know, sometimes we get a patient, we do, uh, they have some kind of angina on effort, we do a CT scan, which is like, tells you like intermediate uh, stenosis. You know how sensitive CT coronary angio should be more sensitive than coronary angio itself. But when you do a coronary angio, you see actually it looks more significant than CT. Why? And we just, if we do go and do FFR on this one, it will be significant. Do, you, do we stop there? I think that's wrong. This patient should get a nitrate. When you do a nitrate, you see there's a bit of maybe focal, but not really significant. When you do a F, FFR again, is it much improved? Okay, so is, this is a diffuse disease, not just a focal disease. This patient also got, in addition to this diffuse, got, got also microvascular. This patient need an optimal medical treatment, no stent, but medical management. So not every uh, focal, or not every normal artery we should just say is, is fine, we should go beyond that. So careful history, as our colleague today said, is should be our, this is what we learn as a physician, this should be our life. And this, should, this, is, the, this is what remain, I think, despite all the technology change. If we spend some, and invest some time with our patient, we're able to diagnose most of our patients and we know where, where's underlying problem. So physical examination to know if the patient got metabolic syndrome and that's all, all help. And not to forget, you know, when you come to the X syndrome or the uh, uh, NOCA management is lifestyle. And then, you know, management is, depends on what is the make, underlying mechanism, could be mixed, could be, myca, could be functional, could be structural, but, you know, it's all, all come through the proper assessment, proper investigations. So coronary myocardial dysfunction is an important chemical entity, directly contributes to morbidity and mortality. And of course, to burden on our uh, financial and our the life of everyone, clinician, the patient, and the, the, their, their, their relatives. Worse than outcome for patient with the CAD and MI, technology has advanced our knowledge of this entity. We used to call it X syndrome and that's it, but now uh, we are more uh, aware, more, I think more to learn, of course. We are not saying we have reached the, we still need to learn because until now we have limited evidence based on therapy because what we need is target, targeted therapy. You know, when we treat, we try and individualize and we know what to treat. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor uh, Shahab. Um, so I like, I think we, we, are, we have a bit of time <clears throat> in this segment. Um, can I invite uh, our panelists, um, uh, Professor Harun and uh, Professor Lin, um, to pro perhaps uh, ask their questions or provide some comments to Professor Shahab's uh, uh, talk. Uh, perhaps Professor Harun first, any comments? Okay. Hey, Hello, uh, can you uh, hear hi. me? Yes. yes. Thank you very much for inviting me on this forum. And it is a pleasure to hear these excellent presentations by Professor Shahab and Dr. Abdullah Shahab as well and Dr. Shahbaz as well. Well, of course, this is a disease which is uh, very prevalent now in our part of the world as well. And as uh, Professor Shahbaz pointed out that it has become an endemic. We should all be very careful, especially when we go through our patients we classify our patients into ischemic heart disease, into diabetics, patients with multiple risk factors. And we have got all the scores which show us what are the 10 years and 20 year risk to the patients. But my own opinion or my view is that this metabolic syndrome should, is, a, is a separate category which is encompassing or enclosing all these diseases, metabolic diseases, into a one syndrome. And we should respect, especially these type of patients who have gone into the territory of this disease. Because this disease may present with few features in the early part, like 
low HDL, high triglycerides, borderline diabetes, or you can see say pre-diabetes picture, obesity, even somebody may not be obese. But if we catch these patients earlier, we will be at a better platform to prevent the complications which will set in to treat these people and to decrease the burden of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, dyslipidemias, etc. So I have got, learned a lot in the last one and a half, one hour or a half hour from these presentations, and we keep on learning by these webinars. And of course, I will let my other uh, colleague to speak or to discuss whatever he wants to say. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Professor Harun. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Lin to share his uh, thoughts on the preceding uh, two talks, uh, perhaps on uh, Professor Shahab's uh, talk first. Uh, Professor okay. Lin, please. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for two excellent talk. I just have uh, one uh, question because uh, Professor uh, Kirash writes mm -hmm. a very important uh, question about the definition of the different component in metabolic syndrome. As I say in Pakistan, the fasting glucose should be more than 110 uh, as a uh, criteria for uh, metabolic syndrome. But you raise the, the uh, local epidemiology data to show maybe the HbA1c may be uh, for di diagnosis of diabetes should be lower than the uh, Western country. So uh, in Pakistan, uh, should we uh, try to uh, lower the facing glucose uh, uh, for the diagnosis of diabetes, or especially in maybe in the Asian population, despite uh, different components, maybe different from the Western country, not only in the uh, waste, but also in the other component. What's your opinion? Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Shabazz, I think the question was uh, was directed at you um, and uh, had to do with the uh, definitions or the criteria uh, for diabetes and uh, uh, I think specifically uh, on that uh, in Asians. So would you have any comments to that? From the, the, the question, can you repeat it? So, I think uh, maybe to paraphrase uh, Professor Lin, uh, he's asking, should the definition uh, for the thresholds for diabetes be different in Asians? Professor Lin, I'm correct? Yes, I think it is, uh, th this is absolutely right. Because what we saw was that, uh, uh, as I showed to you in the study, which was uh, published, showed that the HbA1c and the uh, OGTT levels, they did not coincide with each other. And the fasting blood glucose levels should be perhaps lowered than the Western population, as should be the lipid profile also to be considered to be lower as compared to the Western population. And I think that uh, it is similar to what we saw as far as the central obesity is concerned, where you have uh, the waist circumference, which is less than the Caucasians or the Western population. So I think the fasting blood uh, glucose should definitely be uh, considered to be lower as compared to the Western population because of our body size, because of our frontal obesity, and because of our uh, lifestyle also, there, uh, there is a variation. Professor Lin, uh, thank you, Professor Sh um, Sh uh, Shabab, uh, uh, Shabazz. Can I check with Professor Lin? Uh, do you agree with that? Yes. Uh, I, I think uh, maybe uh, this five component uh, maybe uh, we find differently uh, in Asian population uh, in the uh, Western country, not only in the uh, uh, West, uh, uh, maybe glucose or maybe uh, this epidemia should be more revived, if possible. Thank you. I think it is basically the ethnic variations which are there, and we should take an, into consideration uh, ethnic variations and the race variations. Yes. In. Well, I, 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 I think there's definitely some um, uh, logic uh, to that. 
I guess my main concern is that um, if we were to say that we would like to have a different threshold or criteria, uh, then we must have the research to have actionable uh, levels to, to base it on. Because um, um, without that, uh, we would be you know, guessing at what the right level would be. Um, and I'm a bit nervous about that, not, not because I disagree with the notion, but because I'm not sure what the right line is. Um, and if we don't have the right line, then there are a lot of implications uh, downstream. You know, when do we initiate treatment? Uh, how do we label people? Um, and how would that affect their subsequent, you know, uh, insurance or healthcare? Um, I think there are certainly uh, multiple levels of consideration. I do think that there is a, a, a definitely a so-called burning platform for us to establish, uh, establish uh, these uh, thresholds. Um, and that requires a vigorous uh, research. So mm -hmm. I, I, I would like to, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, agree with that notion that maybe we need to broaden or consider that conceptual framework shift, but the data needs to be there for us to be sure what the right line is. Um, I think we can come back to this in the discussion later on. Uh, given time, uh, may I ask uh, Dr. Yasir, I, I see your hand up. Perhaps we could leave it towards the end uh, for the discussion. But at this point in time, uh, so that we can move on, uh, maybe I can invite Professor uh, uh, Lin to invite our third speaker. Um, Professor Lin, uh, over to you, please. Okay, I'll introduce the third speaker uh, before going to the final discussion. The third speaker will be Dr. Chen Haoming from Taipei, Taiwan. He is presently the uh, director of the uh, evidence-based medicine in Taipei Veteran Medical Medical General Hospital. He is also associate professor of the National Yami University in Taiwan. The topic that Dr. Chen Haomi is going to talk about is the title is How to Manage Cardiometabolic Syndrome. Dr. Chen, please. Thank you. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, that's very yes. good. Do you see my share slide? Yes, the slide yes. is good. Okay. Thank you. Dear colleagues, Mr. Chairman, it's my pleasure to share with you the topic about how to manage cardiometabolic syndrome. Uh, this is my conflict of interest disclosure. This is the presentation outline. I will briefly introduce the benefit of treating cardiometabolic syndrome and uh, its pathophysiology. The basic principle of the management is to tackle with each component of metabolic syndrome. The first question to answer is that whether reverting metabolic syndrome is beneficial. In this nationwide cohort study published in Annals of Internal Medicine, metabolic syndrome status was followed up by using the harmonizing criteria in the first three health screening, S1, S2, and S3. This figure demonstrates clearly that subjects recovered from metabolic syndrome had a significantly lower risk of mass as compared with those who developed metabolic syndrome during the follow-up or who had persistent metabolic syndrome. There was a clear dose-response relationship, not only for mass, but also for all other outcomes. More interestingly, they evaluated the decreased risk associated with the recovery of each metabolic syndrome component and increased risk of the newly development of each component. It is interesting to know that the high BP is the most important risk factor in all outcomes. To manage cardiometabolic syndrome, we must understand first its causative factors. The core of cardiometabolic syndrome is the insulin resistance and central obesity. Other possible factors, including genetics and physical inactivity. Therefore, when targeting cardiometabolic risk, we must deal with all these risk factors, which subsequently cause increased risk of cardiovascular disease. This review article summarizes the treatment strategy for each of these important risk factors. As you can see, lifestyle modification plays a very important central role for all components of metabolic syndrome. Now we'll first discuss the strategy to manage the metabolic syndrome, lifestyle modification first. The insulin resistant atherosclerosis study was a prospective obs observational study of around 1,400 patients with variable degrees of glucose tolerance. The regular exercise was noted to improve insulin sensitivity and lower fasting insulin level. Another cohort study using the enhanced data suggests that even moderate exercise is associated with a reduction in all cause and severe mortality. 
and the associ association was most robust in hepatitis subjects. Although a trend to benefit was also seen at lower BP levels. We have recently published in Journal Hypertension, which investigates the effect of DASH diet. As you can see in this figure, that shows the DASH diet at a low panel plus low salt diet can not only reduce blood pressure, but also the blood pressure fluctuations. There are different dietary patterns for different components of metabolic syndrome. For example, to lower blood pressure, this diet or Mediterranean diet with low sodium is most effective. But to reduce lipid and blood sugar and overweight, low carbohydrate diet and low fat diet are more helpful. The National Diabetes Prevention Program is a partnership of public and private sectors working together to prevent the delay of type, type 2 diabetes. Because of concern regarding its liver toxicity, the troglitazone arm was discontinued. And in at the remaining three arms, the trial randomized around 3,000 individuals with metabolic syndromes uh, into the uh, placebo or metformin or lifestyle modification. As you can see, the lifestyle modification and metformin can cause a reduction of diabetes instance by 48 and 31% uh, respectively. In the previous meta-analysis by combining the randomized control trial, uh, lifestyle modification consistently demonstrated reduction in newly onset diabetes. The relative risk reduction was around 45%. In our 2015 hypertension guideline of Taiwan, we used the mnemonic SABCDE for lifestyle modification, which stands for sodium, alcohol, body weight, cigarette, diet, and exercise. ADA in 2019 published a consensus statement about the nutrition therapy, which summarized the guide for different dietary patterns. In summary, there is a growing emphasis on the low carbohydrate diet, weight loss is an important issue, and high fiber with non-starchy vegetable is helpful. There is also an ongoing enthusiasm about gut microbiota. It has been shown that metabolic syndrome is associated with intestinal dysbiosis of gut microbiota. There are also ongoing efforts which try to implement the concept of the management of microbiome in the battle of metabolic syndrome, such as fecal microbiota transplantation and bioacid. So how about the strategy for obesity? In our previous paper, we demonstrate that the presence and progression of abdominal obesity as measured by the waist circumference are um, predictors of future hypertension. And for subject with severe obesity, we can consider weight loss surgery. There are three major types of surgeries. The middle type, following reduction, is now the most popular one. We can classify the surgery into the male absorptive or restrictive. The mechanism of the metabolic surgery involves not only the uh, mechanical, but also the change of intestinal hormone. The BDO pancreatic diversion will decrease the anti incretin factors in the duodenum which will cause the increased effect of incretin and the better blood sugar profile. As you can see in this uh, meta-analysis, with wet load surgery, there was an increased odds of DN remission and the glycemic control. It was shown in the Swedish obese uh, uh, subject study that the surgery group, as compared with the conventional treatment, had a better profiles of all components of metabolic syndrome, including weight, uh, blood pressure, HDL, and infecting blood sugar. Now the recommendation for bariatric surgery is mainly for subjects with BMI more than 35 in Asian, or BMI more than 30 in diabetes, or pro control diabetes subjects with BMI more than uh, 27.5. Next, we will discuss the strategy for high blood pressure. If evidence has been garnered indicating that insulin resistance and the resultant hyperinsulinemia are causally related to hypertension, the interruption of this pathway creates a resistance to the actions of insulin or insulin-like growth factor one in stimulating vascular NO. In UK PDS, tight blood pressure control was associated with greater CV risk reduction compared to tight glycemic control. The reduction of BB targets for diabetes subjects was suggested by UKPDAs from uh, 154 to 144. 
advanced study from 140 to 135. And then a code BP on attempt to lower the, its BP target to 120. In the code BP on, around 4,700 diabetes patients were randomized into an intensive BP lowering treatment with a goal of around uh, 120 and a great and, and a conventional 140. There was no significant difference in the primary endpoint between the group. There was a significant difference in stroke between the intensive and the standard BP lowering arms. And the SPRINT trial is the most important lemma study in the recent 20 years, which compare aggressive BP treatment with a target of SBP120 versus conventional strategy of SBP140. It has been shown impressively that aggressive BP reduction with BP target at 120 was associated with a risk reduction of 25% for primary endpoint and 27% for all cause mortality. Later, there was a post hoc analysis which analyzed a co study population by SPRINT's inclusion criteria. We call that the SPRINT eligible co BP participants. Again, the results was consistent with the SPRINT study the intensive BP control is better. In a recent published large IPD meta-analysis, BPLTTC, subject with or without CVD, could all benefit from aggressive BP control. More importantly, the benefit can be seen with BP target down to 120. Therefore, the 2017 ACDH habitant guidelines suggest to treat the patients with BP more than 1380 if there is a history of CVD, a predicted 10 year CV risk of more than 10%, diabetes, CKD, or elderly. In addition, I would like to emphasize the importance of home BP. As a leading author, we recently published a 2020 Taiwan home BP consensus. Subsequently, we will have an innovative approach that we will change the management tool of choice to home BP monitoring. The definition of hypertension in Taiwan now will be 1380 millimeter mercury based on home BP monitoring or daytime awake ABPM. For subject with the number of risk factors more than three, more than or equal three, the treatment target will also be 1380. However, which is the most suitable agent for metabolic syndrome? It has been shown in previous study that Rosbrock K was associated with a low risk of new onset diabetes. In the network meta-analysis published by Taiwan researchers, effects of different anti-hypertensive agents were compared for all cause mortality, ESRD or doubling uh, creatinine, serum creatinine, Rosbrock K best treatment strategy always ranked in the first or second as the most advantageous agent. So now let's move on to the strategy for hypoglycemia. Is lowering high blood sugar beneficial for cardiovascular outcomes? We conducted a meta-regression analysis for the trials, including a code, advanced VADT and UKBDS, which utilized a conventional anti-diabetic agents. There is apparently no low is better phenomenon. However, Many novel anti-diabetic agents with minimal hypoglycemic risk have been developed. We recently published a meta-regression analysis in DOM. In the subgroup analysis, stratified by the, uh, the uh, decrease of A1C label, the lower is better phenomenon is very obvious. In this meta-regression, in contrast to the conventional agents, the lower is better phenomenon is very clear in studies using anti-diabetic agents with minimal hypoglycemic risk. We can even derive the equation that lowering A1C by 1% convert a significant risk reduction by 30% for mass and 40% for stroke. And we recently update our analysis by including studies published after 2018. The lower is better phenomenon is still very clear. You can notice from this figure, the slope is almost not changed by including seven more studies. Now let's move to the, uh, uh, the dyslipidemia. In subject with diabetes or insulin resistance, we usually observe the increase in TG, small dense LDL and decreased HDL. The insulin resistance is linear, uh, linearly associated with TG. This table shows the sequel analysis for diabetes subjects in previous previously published lemma trials. 
the risk reduction of CHD ranged from 11 to 25 percent, which was similar to overall population. In the trip to new target study, there is a subgroup analysis including metabolic syndrome of around 5,500 5, subjects allocated to a total study 10 or 80 milligram. In the analysis with or without diabetes, intensive treatment can result in a 30% risk reduction in all metabolic syndrome subjects. So these figures shows an apparent lower is better phenomenon for LDL cholesterol that a greater reduction in the LDL resulted in a greater reduction in CV events, especially in secondary prevention and all patients with diabetes as shown in the red line in this figure. So low is better phenomenon for uh, LDL is true. In the meta-analysis of diabetes patients, treatment with an HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor resulted in a reduced CV risk. The risk reduction in subject with or without diabetes were similar. So how about triglyceride? In the lipid arm of a cold study, subjects were randomized into the phenofibrate or placebo. The results were disappointing. Lowering TG is not helpful for the three-point mass. This figure is the summary of the target of our Taiwan Society of Lipids and Atherosclerosis test lock guideline in different disease. For primary prevention of diabetes, the target is 100. For secondary prevention, the target is 70. For subject with ACS plus diabetes, a target of 55 milligram per deciliter can be considered. Lastly, let us check the hypercoagulability. Aspirin provides varying degree of CV risk reduction in diabetes uh, patients. In this important meta-analysis investigating the primary prevention effect of aspirin, the use of aspirin is associated with a low risk of mass but an increased risk of major bleeding in diabetic patients. Therefore, the 2090 ESC guideline does not provide strong recommendations for antiplatelet therapy in diabetic patients without CVD. However, aspirin may be considered in high risk of, of, of very high risk patients in the absence of contraindication. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I would like to use Steno2 study to finish my presentation. The standard two study randomized 160 patients with type 2 diabetes and microalbuminuria to the target intensive multifactorial intervention or conventional treatment. The hazard ratio of standard two for primary endpoint in the intensive group was 0.47. By the holistic care for subjects with cardiometabolic syndrome, including A, B, C, D, E, F, their prognosis can be substantially improved. Previous evidence has demonstrated in a convincing way that controlling ABC, the cardiovascular risk can be reduced by 30 to 50%. With, it, with this final slide, I would like to conclude that by treating each component, including A1C plus sugar lipid to the target, we can greatly improve the outcomes of subjects with cardiometabolic syndrome. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you to Dr. Chen's interesting talk. May I ask the two panelists to give a comments? Maybe starting with uh, Professor Lin, Lin Zhongxian from Taiwan. Do you have a comment about Dr. Chen's talk? Okay, thank you for Professor Chen's uh, excellent talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, we should treat uh, the metabolic syndrome from different parts, including uh, weight reduction, exercise, uh, body reduction, uh, maybe a surgery, uh, treat uh, blood pressure, uh, dyslipidemia, uh, and et cetera. Uh, finally, you, you mentioned the importance of the trial of sternal two to tell us the uh, maybe combination therapy of different strategy is very important. And uh, as, as we know, uh, the five components of metabolic syndrome include uh, hypertriglycemia and uh, uh, low HDL. Uh, uh, recently, there are some uh, uh, drugs uh, targeting the uh, elevated, elevation of HDL but fail, but uh, some try uh, using uh, fish oil, especially uh, EPA, uh, 
may be beneficial for cardiovascular disease. And uh, recently, some uh, promising agent such as uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, may targeting uh, in the glucose lowering and the body weight reduction may be also a promising agent for a metabolic syndrome. I think uh, uh, there are some uh, new strategy for this kind of patient. Thank you for your uh, talk. Yes, uh, thank you for Professor Lee's comment. Maybe uh, Professor Harun Aziz Ababa. Professor Harun. The microphone, the microphone should be turned on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me for the comments. Well, it was an excellent presentation and uh, <clears throat> we learned a lot from it. And as uh, I already uh, before commented, that metabolic syndrome patients should be caught at an earlier stage. And if they are caught at an earlier stage where this syndrome is developing, we stand, the patient stands a better chance of, de of decreased complications as well as a healthy lifestyle. So as we have heard this uh, presentation. The emphasis is on that the sedentary lifestyle should go away. It should be avoided. And as it has been recommended that at least 150 minutes of regular exercise per week is what is needed. This is the minimum. It can be increased as well, but this is the minimum. And of course, the dietary lifestyle changes, the DASH diet, mm -hmm. these are very important. Decreasing the weight, obesity, definitely yes. may be I one part of the metabolic syndrome. So keeping an ideal weight is very important. To control your blood sugar levels so that the hemoglobin A1C should be between 6.5 to 7, or at least around 6.5. These should be the targets in adult population below 60 years of age. In people who are above 60, we are slightly liberal with them. And we give them targets of around 7% hemoglobin A1C or 7.5. Because as all of you are aware, that hypoglycemic risk carries a sudden morbidity and mortality. So keeping in view all these things, we should concentrate their stage on blood sugar levels, quit. We should ask the patient to quit smoking, to develop a healthy lifestyle. Regular exercise should be advocated and to keep the weight in the ideal weight category should be incurring. Because if you lose weight, you lose blood pressure. If you lose weight, you lose dyslipidemia. If you lose weight, you lose metabolic syndrome. So this is what I can, for the moment, say and comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for Dr. Aurora's interesting comments. And I will... Uh, Give it back to uh, Professor Yo to start a discussion part. We still have some time. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lin, and thank you to all our speakers for a very, very uh, nice um, overview and this and uh, talks on uh, the cardiometabolic uh, disease. <clears throat> I'm going to get the ball rolling, uh, but first of all, uh, I recognize that uh, Dr. Yasir. Uh, had a comment early on, uh, Doctor Yasi. If I, if I, if you would like, uh, you please uh, um, uh, make your comment. I, of course, would. Uh, 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 would you like to make your comment or question, Doctor Yasi? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Just I've got one question. Uh, what would be the triglyceride upper limit, or what we call the highest limit uh, of TG to diagnose 
or to fit in diagnosis of metabolic syndrome? Is, is there any criteria or few numbers are deranged and we, will, we can say it's a, a criteria is fulfilling? So maybe I'll ask uh, Dr. Shabazz to take that question. The question is, what is the TG level that would uh, fit the metabolic syndrome? According to the definition, I think the question is very relevant. According to the definition, when you have a waist circumference, which is uh, 90 centimeters in men and 80 centimeters in women in our part of the world, HDL, which is less than uh, 40 uh, in men and less than 50 in women, and TG more than 150, that is uh, the criteria for it. Because uh, as the TG levels go up, it's not that you have to have a, a TG levels at 400 or 500 to diagnose them as metabolic syndrome. But when you have three of these uh, criteria <laughs> met, you have a patient with metabolic syndrome. And uh, then uh, earlier on, when uh, uh, Professor Yeo was mentioning about the threshold, if, uh, if you remember, I had actually alluded to one of the studies of the NDSP, the National Diabetes Study in, of Pakistan, where the HbA1c level was uh, less was at about 6.7 which uh, showed diabetes and pre-diabetes mm -hmm. as compared to the western population but uh, i totally agree with you that we need more data on it and we need to have more studies in our part of the world to show us as to what should be the optimum levels because obviously when you diagnose uh, somebody with diabetes or pre-diabetes, according to the newer definition or newer levels, you, there will be a lot of implications there. So I think that is that's a very very valid point, and we should keep that in consideration. When we, uh, the last presentation actually was very good, uh, and it was it is, uh, as regards the uh, the uh, management of it in the different aspects of it. Now, a very important part of the management of metabolic syndrome is the lifestyle intervention. What I want to start the ball rolling in this uh, direction is that what so uh, societal and infrastructural changes we as nations can bring about to encourage lifestyle changes, number one. And number two, somebody with metabolic syndrome, how sustainable are the lifestyle changes in the different parts here? For example, in Singapore, how it would be, how it would be in Taiwan, and what are you, what are the rest of the uh, the, the uh, areas people are doing as far as the implementation? Because what I think is that people would sustain it for two months, six months, or a year even, but then they will start going back into the old habit. So lifestyle changes need to be addressed on a very long-term basis. It's a life, actually lifestyle means throughout life. And this is what we have to impress upon our patients. And, 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 and a very important part of uh, metabolic syndrome and the management of our patients is what Sir William Ostler said, that you need actually to listen to the patient. When we are with the patient, we need to discuss it, how to manage them, what to do. And I think that is an extremely important aspect of it because there are two stakeholders in it, the, 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 the uh, doctor and the patient. The patient must be aware of what his condition is, what are the chances are that he's going to get into diabetes, he's going to get into cardiovascular diseases because the mortality there is going to increase. So I think let's, let's discuss the lifestyle interventions also as in, in addition to the medical management. So uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Shabazz, uh, and uh, thanks, Dr. Yasir, for your question. So I agree that uh, our, uh, our society needs to, to change, uh, how do I put it, influence how our patients and our population um, views uh, these lifestyle changes. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned Singapore, and uh, as, as many of you know, Singapore does have uh, a you know, a government that uh, takes an active role in this uh, population's uh, well-being. Uh, and uh, we have the war on diabetes, um, which is, which literally the government declared war on diabetes. Um, there are um, very active measures to encourage people to take the stairs and walk. Uh, there are parks 
Um, and um, in many cases, uh, our politicians uh, go running and put photos themselves running. So I think uh, government does make a difference. Uh, secondly, I think professional societies like the Pakistan Kadia Society in hosting this uh, webinar um, is, uh, is taking an active role in encouraging our population to, you know, and our practitioners of medicine to, uh, to encourage its people to lead a healthy lifestyle. Um, I think that's terribly important. Uh, government alone will make it, a society, professional society alone will make it, and certainly uh, we need our people to, to take an active step. Um, so I, I, I think your emphasis is uh, spot on, much more important than what we can deliver as drugs, uh, for drugs and other, and other therapeutic agents. Having said that, I want to uh, ask uh, uh, Professor um, uh, 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 Lin and uh, uh, Professor Cheng a question about therapeutics. Um, you know, um, the American Diabetes uh, I think Association just had a nice uh, uh, paper presented on uh, a twin cretin, uh, weight loss agents uh, together with semaglutide, uh, other GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists. So, you know, it's hard to get people to exercise, eat well and pray and meditate and do yoga. Um, how about if we just give them a pill, you know, give them a, or injection in this case, a GLP-1 receptor agonist and make them lose 10 kilograms. So maybe I'll ask Dr. Cheng, uh, well, how would you comment to that? Is, that? is that a magic bullet? Yeah, thank you for this very uh, good question. Actually, I, I, because of time limitation, I don't have time to present uh, the novel agents uh, such as GLP-1 agonist and, and uh, SGLT-2 inhibitor. Actually, they are very important in dealing with the metabolic syndrome. And uh, I think uh, they, both of these two strategies are, are, are very important. They can be uh, done in, the, in patients together. So like uh, SGLT-2 inhibitor and the uh, GLP-1, they, they both can reduce body weight. And from the animal studies or human studies, they, they uh, analyze the components of the body weight loss is on the uh, lean mass rather than uh, is on the fat fat mass rather than on the lean mass. So actually, they they can reduce the uh, the, the uh, intra abdominal visceral abdominal fat rather than the subcutaneous fat. So I think uh, uh, the new agents, especially like uh, GLP one agonist, they they can. Uh, some of them have the indications for uh, body weight reduction. So uh, they, they can be very promising in the future. But uh, we, we, we still should uh, emphasize the uh, lifestyle modification because lifestyle modification can not only reduce body weight, they can also reduce the blood pressure and also the inflammation. So I think physical activity should be encouraged and in, in the future, probably some new uh, and, uh, the new antidiabetic agents such as GLP-1, GLP-2 can have their role in the management of metabolic syndrome. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for that uh, comment and for um, you know your thoughts not just on the GLP-1 receptor and can and agonist, but also on the SGLT-2 antagonist. Um, to Dr. Shahab, I would like to ask in the in the uh, UAE. Does your does the government take an active role in uh, encouraging a healthy lifestyle, and is there something we can learn uh, from your part of the world? Thank you very much. I think that's a very important question, and uh, I'm not maybe the right person to answer this. Is normally the government to <laughs> answer this? But as, as a physician, we always try to you know uh, the problem with that, with any meeting I go to, you try to talk about the, what role of the government. I think what should be role of our physician. I'll come to that. Your to your question, I think role of physician, as all we say, you know, is really the relationship with the, with our patient to start with. We invest the first visit with them because that's where we lo lose them. You know, we don't they don't trust us. They will not take anything from us. You're talking about lifestyle modification, lifestyle. Food. I mean. We prescribe medication very nicely. We say three times a day, this, the dose. Can we prescribe lifestyle? If we're able to do that, then I think, you know, we are doing the good job. I think the government in UAE doing, you know, started to do a great job. Actually, they, they provided the, the, the places where they can exercise. They helped with the, with a diet, you know, the, the vegetable fruits and the, some of the, you know, uh, nice diet are uh, supported by the government. There are lots of encouragement, uh, you know, uh, awareness for, for our patients. You know, uh, pe these kind of things we expect from the government more, of course, and more. But I think metabolic syndrome, it's really, it's, it's, um, it's, a, tar it's a moving target. You know, every time they change the definition, 
the prevalence increases, you know, and they can notice that happen to hypertension, diabetes, mm -hmm. but you know, we need to, we need to focus on diet, you know, improve our diet, stress, you know, that's the amount of stress we have as a physician, look at us, you know, our life, very stressful life, but we can change it to passionate, you know, to be more passionate in our, you know, in our work. I think if we, if we look at ourselves, then that will be the fix on our patients. Thank you. I think I, I have a, can I, can I just uh, make a couple yes, of- Yes, of course, sir. Dr. Shabazz, please. Uh, you see, when we are talking about lifestyle intervention in our patients, we need to be very practical. Number one is that uh, it is sustainable only if the patient becomes a party to it mm -hmm. and agrees to it. And number two, sometimes you cannot expect a patient to start uh, running three to five kilometers every day like my dear friend, Professor Harun Babur, if he goes to the gym and exercise, you won't find many patients doing that or giving up smoking completely or uh, uh, be having a diet which is uh, very healthy. So I think what we need to do is to have a modest reduction. We should be more practical when we are talking to our patients and gradually build them up. And then they will be able to probably accept the lifestyle changes which they can then adopt. But I, I, I was, I'm really very ha uh, happy to see that in Singapore and to know from uh, Professor Yeo that in Singapore, you have a very good commitment from the government to actually start with the, uh, lifestyle changes. And this is something which is needed in most of our countries. And it is also needed, for example, to actually reduce our, the population. Of, we are one fourth of the population of the world here in this part of uh, in South Asia. And we need to actually reduce the population also. This is also very important. And, and we need for that a lot of commitment from the government. I've, I had been in the government sector for about 45 years. And I tried my best to uh, convince the politicians who would come to me and to ask them to pass legislatures for it. But unfortunately, it could not be done. We passed a legislature on no smoking. And in every government office, I would go who, who would be smokers, they would continue to smoke. And if I was to tell them that uh, the, you, uh, this is something which is against the law and you are going to be uh, fined 1,000 rupees for that, and they would tell me that they have put the notice at, uh, on the back of their, uh, on the back wall, and so they don't see it. You see, the, the, the government commitment is extremely important. And I think uh, Pakistan Cardiac Society, uh, Professor Harun Baba, the president, he can, they, they can uh, try to take a lead role in it. We need to actually change our approach towards the, uh, our lives. We need to actually have a very healthy lifestyle. I, I, I think it's uh, what, uh, what uh, we hope to do is never easy. And as they say, uh, anything that is worthwhile doing is never going to be easy. I, I would like to take a slight twist to the discussion. Uh, and perhaps this would be the last question. And I want to ask uh, Professor Sumro, um, in regards to the metabolic or the cardiometabolic conditions, do you, do you think that in women, there is a specific uh, Ray, uh, sorry, um, you know, gender uh, aspect that we should be mindful of. Could you share your thoughts on that, the Professor Sumro? Because, because he showed us many cases of with uh, meta cardio metabolic syndrome. Talking mm -hmm. about the Pakistan, we have different conditions in rural and urban areas which which is more common in uh, our conditions are more uh, likely to the uh, other South Asian uh, countries like India and Sri Lanka. They all have the same um, uh, conditions, socio-cultural conditions in which we are living. But comparatively, India and uh, um, Sri Lanka are having much better educational level and the awareness in the women. In our part of, of the um, uh, part of Pakistan, our women are having uh, more suffering from the metabolic syndrome because especially if we consider the urban area women, 
they are having more problems, stressful life, and they lack of exercise, uh, overwork, and they don't have physical um, physical work in uh, urban areas. But in rural areas, when it's comparatively, despite of the lack of awareness and the lack of the education, education, they are much better than the uh, uh, male partners in those areas. And uh, uh, as we know that uh, um, our socio-cultural values usually don't allow us to follow the lifestyle, uh, uh, ideal fi uh, lifestyle modifications uh, in this part of the world. That's it. Thank you, Professor Sumro. And uh, I think we are uh, right on the dot at, at uh, well, 6 p.m. Uh, Singapore time. Um, again, I'd like to uh, thank um, uh, all our speakers today. Uh, I'd like to thank the Pakistan Cardio Society on behalf of the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology, all our speakers, uh, chairpersons, as well as panelists uh, for having for doing this wonderful session. I think this is a very, very relevant uh, topic for our community in Asia. And uh, with that, I'd like to close the session and again, thank the Taiwan Heart Foundation for hosting us on their platform. Thanks very much and have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.